Good evening, good evening. Whew, the wind's back. I don't know if you noticed or not. Uh, sure is good to see everybody this evening. I was, um, you know, we've, apparently we have a number of dogs at the house. They're not all mine dogs. I don't, a neighbor has a dog that uh, they decided was, you know, going to live in both places. We have joint custody uh, of the dog, a little pug. And Amanda was outside just uh, just the other day, and um, the dog was was trotting down the road, and had our dog's collar in its mouth. <laughs> so I don't know how that happened. I think she was trying to drag her through the fence, and the collar came off. And I guess that was good enough. But uh, so we've got all kinds of chaos <laughs> ensuing at our house. Um, I hope you guys are not as chaotic as we are. Oh yeah, she's fine. Yeah, she's. They were sharing. It's real funny because the pug's about this big and Luna's about, you know, that big. So <laughs> they make a fun couple. <clears throat> All right. So we're going we're gonna to continue talking about this, this subject of leadership, um, biblical leadership. And we've been building, building up on this and just adding to it as we've been moving along. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've been really encouraged as I've studied through this topic and, and thought about how the Bible presents this topic. Um, a lot of times we are given a lot of information about what a leader is supposed to look like, and uh, then we come to the Bible, and, and it has a tendency to take our definitions of things and kind of turn them upside down and flip them over. And I think this is one of those definitions that gets a little um, um, turned over as we, as we begin to talk about what the Bible teaches on, on the topic of leadership. And so we have made it to seven basic tenets of leadership, and uh, I'm going to, of course, quiz you on those. I want to see if you remember all seven of those. We've added some since then, and we're going to add two today. Um, so anybody remember what, what they were? What are the seven tenets? You got it written down somewhere, Joel? Is that your list? Okay. 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 Oh, somebody's got it written down. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. So what do we got? What are our seven, seven tenets of um, Biblical leadership. What's the first one? Okay. Got it. They're good. Love. Starts with humility. Very good. And the last two are going to be more challenging because we haven't looked, talked about them nearly as much, but there's two more that we added. Yeah, okay, right, yeah. Uh, um, imitators of Christ and leading by... Examples. So those are the ones we talked about with Peter. Good job. Yeah, you do have them written down somewhere, right? Back of your hand. Oh, on a <laughs> oh CVS receipt or something. All right. Good job. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and add two. I'm going to tell you what they are ahead of time. Um, that way we can, we can talk about them as we move along. But as we look at Abraham, he's going to be our, our person of interest. As you noticed, I've skipped a couple of people because we're a few weeks behind. So we're going to jump right on ahead to... Um, to Father Abraham and talk about him. But in the lesson that we're going to be studying today, we're going to learn two more uh, tenets of biblical leadership, and that is living by faith and motivated by hope. So God's leaders are people who live by faith and who are motivated by hope. And so what I want to do is, if you have your Bibles, open up to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to spend our time there and they, there's a lot of summaries. There are a lot of summaries in Acts and in Hebrews, other places in the Bible that summarize different parts of Abraham's life. And I think it's just the easy, it's easier for us to go to the New Testament and read those as opposed to going to Genesis and reading through all the details there. And so that's what we're going to do is spend some time in Hebrews chapter 11 and in Acts 7. So if you want to mark Acts 7 as well, so you don't have to make that, that uh, giant leap. Uh, you're welcome to do that. So we're going to start in verse 8 of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go ahead and read that. The Hebrew writer says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. Okay, that's the Hebrew writer's summary of that. Um, Acts chapter 7 is um, Stephen's defense, and he adds a little detail and I think it would be good for us to go there and read that as well, to add to that. 
and that way we can have a, a better understanding of what's going on. So this is Stephen's defense in Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 2. I'm going to read it to you. It says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. And then verse 4 says, Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no children, he promised that he would give it to him um, as a possession, the land. And to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, and they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation uh, to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. Okay, so there's our, all the, the information that we're going to, to sit, and sit on for a little bit and talk about. Um, so the first question I want to ask you as we're speaking about Abraham and talking about his life and thinking about our tenets of, of uh, leadership, um, in what way, in what way is, is, did Abraham receive a position of leadership? In what way does he have authority or in what way did God give him authority? What, who is he? How would we title him? Any ideas? Sorry, faithful? Okay. But I mean, we're, when we talked about um, leadership in general, we, we talked about the fact that God is the one that gives people leadership or authority, that he puts them in places of authority. How does that apply to Abraham? Who is he in regards to his family? He's a patriarch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's the patriarch. He's the one that's supposed to be in charge. He, he's the one that has authority in his family. That was the structure that God had, had established for him. Um, it, it is believed, and I, you know, I didn't know this until years and years and years and years later, um, after, you know, um, having thought something different, that Abraham was most likely a very wealthy person. And uh, a lot of scholars believe that he was uh, extremely wealthy, that he had a big family, that he was leaving behind great wealth and um, prestige in the land in which he came from. In fact, I heard one scholar call him a sheik, if you can imagine that in, in your mind of who he may have been. I don't know where I got the impression that Abraham was just kind of a lowly shepherd. Maybe it's from some Bible class pictures or you know, those Bibles that have pictures in them, you know, and you look at them and you're thinking, oh, yeah, that's Abraham. But, you know, mentally I put that picture together that he was just kind of a guy who had a few sheep and a couple of family members and they took off, you know, and for better things. Um, but a lot of Hebrew scholars believe that he was extremely wealthy and powerful and a man of, of reputation. And so he was leaving behind a lot to, to follow after um, or obey God. In, in leaving the land. Um, I think that's, that's an accurate assessment, but it kind of paints a little different picture when it says that God called him and he went. <laughs> it's not as if he was in a lowly position and God was calling him into a great position. He was most likely in a pretty high position and God was calling him out into the wilderness um, to spend a tremendous amount of time away from his homeland um, and based on a promise. So Abraham submitted to God. That was one, one of our key words, and that word is seen in the word obedience, that he obeyed, or in Stephen's defense that when God called him, he went. So that's one aspect of him that we understand, that he was obedient. He trusted God. He believed God, and he was committed to, to obeying God. And when we combine all those words together, what one word comes out of that? trusting and commitment and obedience, what word do we get? Just faith. Yeah, faithfulness, faith. Um, that's the one word that comes to mind. And, and so God also told him some things, made some promises uh, that, that he would be a great nation, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. 
He also told him some very disturbing things, according to Stephen, um, that, uh, that his people would be enslaved, that they would be in bondage, um, that his family would, would at some point be in Egyptian bondage, but God would rescue them. He would bring them out. And when he did, that's when they will call upon his name. That's when they will, you know, be, be his people. And so he is given some, some good news. He will be great. He will have a great family. They're going to have a land. But he's going to given some other news that says, you know, but it's not gonna, always going to be easy. There are going to be some challenges, some difficulties along the way. Um, but nonetheless, Abraham trusted God. He believed God's words, believed the promises. And so the fulfillment of the ultimate promise of, of having a, becoming a great nation and having a land and, and being a great people and, and uh, being the, the, um, the bearers of the blessings of God to all, nation, all nations is, is a powerful promise. And uh, Abraham must have embraced that and, and um, made it his own and believed it in such a way that he would obey God. And so when we think about that idea, the expectation of the fulfillment of God's promise, what, what one word would that, would that be? If this were Jeopardy, right? <laughs> so the expe- expectation of the fulfillment of God's promise, what one word would you use there? Starts with an H. Hope. Yeah. Hope. Right? So Abraham had hope. He had this expectation that God would fulfill his promises, even though the path is going to be rocky, even though sometimes it seemed impossible. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, he still had hope. And so he was, he had faith, right? He's driven by faith, but he is motivated by, by hope in the promises of God. Um, the storyline of Abraham's family, I think, is, is incredibly similar to our own in, in the way that um, Stephen presents it especially uh, because he talks about Abraham's family as people who, who are aliens. They're sojourners. They, they, don't, they don't actually possess the land, but they are just kind of nomads, if you will. They're traveling through the land. And, but all along, they... They're living by faith that God is going to fulfill his promises. They have hope that eventually God will give them the land. Um, But in the meantime, they're aliens, right? It's very much like what Peter says about us, that we're sojourners, we're aliens in this land. And uh, we, we are a kingdom of God, but we live in the middle of another kingdom. And uh, we are working our way through this life and through this world and someday God will give us um, a place of our own with him. And so we, we share a lot of similarities with, with the story of Israel, Abraham's family, and, um, and, and we just share a lot of the hope and the expectations that they share in. Passing through. Passing through. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, you know, I wish I could always remember. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I always it pops in my mind every once in a while. Sometimes I see it on Facebook because I posted it years ago. And I'm always a shock. To, was that was 10 years ago? It can't be 10 years ago. Anyway, but he made this comment that really, um, I don't remember the quote directly, but it was really striking to me. But he compared the hopeful expectation of the future home with God as something like a memory uh, of, 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 a, of a place that we've never been. And um, the smell of a flower that we have never smelt. And so it's the idea that we've, we've never actually been there, but it's so real to us, it's as if we've been, been there. We just, we have a memory, but we don't, we've never been there, so the memory is just kind of vague and, and um, difficult to, to ascertain. It's difficult to grasp because it's just, ah, it's just right there. And it's as if uh, you ever smelt something, you know, and you're walking by and it's, Oh, that's, that brings, you know, a memory, but you're kind of struggling. Where did I smell that smell before, you know? It smells so good. That's the idea. It's just something that is in, it's in us. It's ingrained in us that uh, we belong somewhere else, that there is a home for us past this life, that there is a home with God 
where all of the difficulties of this world are going to be dissolved and uh, we will live in peace with God forever. Hopeful expectation. I'm sure they felt that often. Okay, look at verse 9. This is Hebrews chapter 11. He says, By faith he, he lived as an alien in the land of promise. Uh, you know, that's always interesting to me. I mean, he was in the land, okay? But it just wasn't, it wasn't his yet. It didn't belong to him. He was, he was kind of a stranger in his own home. Uh, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise, for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Okay? So biblical leadership requires living by faith and being motivated by hope. Uh, motivated by hopeful expectations of fulfillment of God's promises uh, for us, um, as it was for them as well. And so that's, those are our two, two new words that we're going to be looking at. All right, verse 11. This, we're going to get into Sarah, um, Sarai, of course, during that period of time, but the Hebrew writer uses Sarah. In verse 11, it says, By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Now, we know the story, right? And, and we know exactly what happened during that period of time. And I think it's just a point of interest um, what did Sarah do when she first heard that uh, she was going to have a child of her own? Do y'all remember? Yeah, right? Yeah. And, and really, that's what Isaac means, is laughter. And so she, she laughed. Um, sometimes the meaning of why she laughed was kind of obscured, but nonetheless, she laughed. In fact, um, the, the angel with him <laughs> knew that she had laughed. And so there's a, there's a sense in which we, we kind of, get the feeling like um, maybe she was even somewhat surprised herself, although she knew the promise. Um, they had, in some ways, given up hope in, in, in her being able to conceive. Uh, in fact, so much so that they had decided to take matters into their own hands. Do you all remember that story? Um, in which Abraham... Uh, Sarah encourages Abraham to, uh, to take the maidservant, and what was her name? Hagar. And, and through her, a child would be uh, born into the family. But that, that it's all very messy sometimes, right? Because faith can be very m messy. Um, when we read about these people of faith, and uh, we read about their lives and their experiences and the things they did and the things they didn't do and good or bad, we can see very clearly that although these people had extraordinary faith, their lives were often very messy and cluttered and not always perfect. Um, that can be encouraging, right? Um, because we, we have messy lives too. <laughs> and and we, we make mistakes and, and our faith can be messy. And so it's encouraging to read about these people that when you get to the New Testament, they're just called people of faith. Um, but when you read their story, you start thinking, wow, these guys had some problems. But God is able to, through his mercies and grace, um, over, overlook those, those things. And, um, and their faith was able to see them through it. So faith can be extremely messy. And the Hebrew writer just picks up on the main details. <laughs> that uh, she considered God faithful that uh, she did have a son, that she was faithful. Those are, the, those are the main points. That's what we need to be highlighting. Look at verse 12. He says, Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead, at that as, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sands which are by the seashore. So, the struggle of being a leader, and this may be one of the big struggles that we see from all of the leaders that we'll talk about, is, is um, for one, patience, <laughs> extraordinarily amount, amount of patience that God will do what he says he's going to do, but it's going to be in his time, so there's a lot of that going on. But also, the people who are following you as a leader, Abraham, the people who are following Abraham, his family, his wife, 
somehow keeping them encouraged and motivated to continue, even, even when things are seemingly impossible. And that's one thing that I, I, I see from Abraham was he's a, a man who, yeah, things did look seemingly impossible. And, and there was a point in their life where Sarah didn't see how things were going to work out the way she believed they should, made a suggestion as to what they would do, um, and Abraham has a kind of a crossroads. What is he going to do? But a lot of these leaders are going to have to face a situation where they're going to have to keep the people who are following them encouraged. Now, we, we won't talk too much about Moses, but I mean, Moses had a hard time with that. I mean, he, he couldn't even go up a mountain for a few days without his people, you know, doing something crazy. Um, and God have it saying, you know, okay, that's it. You know, your, your people down there, they're getting crazy, they're getting wild, and he had to step in between them and basically intercede for them. Um, so we see that the leadership, a leadership or biblical leader in the Old Testament, New Testament, needed to keep the people encouraged. Um, Paul is a great example of that, isn't he? All through his letters, it's encouragement, encouragement, and strength, and encouragement, and constantly getting the people through difficult situations and encouraging them, motivating them, reminding them of the promises of God, reminding them of their salvation, reminding them of what God has done for them through Jesus. Constant, constant, constant encouragement. Um, very difficult, but very necessary for their leadership. Um, whether it was the, the father position in the family we saw that the fathers had to keep their families motivated and encouraged and strengthened, whether it's mothers leading children, that's necessary, whether it's grandparents in your position um, in the family, or, or whether it's leading young people, whatever capacity you might be leading young people in, or leading an entire congregation. Um, whatever, whatever the situation is, wherever God has placed you, whatever authority he has put over you, Whoever he has entrusted you with, um, one of your big responsibilities is to keep them encouraged and motivated and strengthened and remind them of the promises of God and living by example, as we've talked about, exercising that authority in the leadership role. Verse 13, he says, all of these died in faith without receiving the promises you know, that would be a really sad story if this were any other story. If this story did not include Jesus, this would be a very sad story. It'd be a story about a bunch of people who made a tremendous amount of sacrifices, did a bunch of stuff, went through a lot of trials and tribulations, and died, right? That would be the story. But what makes this seemingly tragic event not tragic? What, what, what one thing would you say, or one person, or one event in history, makes their death not in vain? He crucified, and what else? Yeah, the resurrection, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole idea, is that just because they died, um, because of the resurrection, we know that, that God can still keep his promises, that his promises are not going to uh, be disturbed or uh, um, disrupted because of death. That death is not going to change anything that God has said. And, and a lot of these live by faith, and they died in faith uh, without receiving the promises, but that's okay. That's okay. Uh, let's continue reading, and I'll read another passage real, from uh, John. This, it continues by saying, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Okay, and we'll get to verse 14 in a minute. I don't want to stop there for just, just a moment. Jesus said in, in John chapter 8 and verse 56 that um, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Okay, your father Abraham, he's speaking to the, of course, the Israelites, your father Abraham rejoiced at the very thought of seeing my day, the, the, the coming Messiah, the fulfillment of these promises, the fulfillment of the law, fulfillment of the prophets, so on and so forth. And then he continues by saying, he saw it and was glad. He saw it and was glad. So there, there is a 
hopeful expectation that transcends death, that transcends this life into the next life, um, as God's people will someday live. Okay, verse 14. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they had went out, you know, the one they came from, they would have had opportunity to return, right? I mean, if, that, if, if the place in which they, they had come out of was the country of, of, of the great hopeful expectation of the fulfillment of God's ultimate promise, uh, they could have just gone back, you know, if that was the reality of things. Uh, but as it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to, to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. Um, Great expectations of faith, extraordinary faith uh, that comes from these people. And and we, we in a lot of ways, share that. I mean, we, we too, share in that feeling of hopeful expectation as we, like we talked about before, sojourn through this life, as we travel through, as we move through this, this life with the, the weakness of our flesh. And we often, many of us, many of us who have been faithful in Christ have, have died, right? Before the coming of Jesus, before the, the reality of the fulfillment of the promise has come to f- fullness. And, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that doesn't change anything. That's not something to be upset about. That's not something to be sad about. Um, Remember Paul talking to the Thessalonians about that, and they were so concerned about those who have died before the coming of Jesus, and he said, that's okay. That's okay, because when Christ come, those who are asleep in Christ will, will, will come up. They will be resurrected. They will, they will be with us. They will go to the Lord as he comes. You know, it's this great, um, um, reunion with Jesus, if you will, and and then those of of us who are alive will be changed or transformed and be with the Lord forever. Um, So hopeful expectations nonetheless, but that's what we're looking forward to. Okay, we're going to move into another section here. We've talked about the good things, the the faith, the motivation, the things that are good about Abraham's life. We're going to we're going to do this with several characters, but we want to talk about the struggles. We want to talk about the bad stuff, the, the mistakes they made. Because those can be just as educational and encouraging for us as examples of people of faith who make mistakes (laughs) as anything else. But before we we make that jump, are there any questions or thoughts on the first section? Any ideas? Okay, let's go ahead and move on. We're going to go ahead and go to Genesis 16. If you want to turn your Bibles to Genesis 16, we're going to read straight from that story. in regards to some of the, the mishaps, the mistakes that were, were taking place that happened during this, um, during this journey of theirs. And so Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 6. And it says, Now Sarai, okay, <laughs> Sarah, Sarai, Abram's wife had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, uh, Now behold, uh, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, and perhaps I will obtain children through her. And this last phrase is really important. We'll spend a lot of time on this. But it says, And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. Okay? Um, now, the first thing that kind of jumps out at you <laughs> might be the fact that here's Abraham and his wife, and um, the, the text makes it clear that her servant was from where? Egypt, right? I mean, I think it's just kind of interesting as you, as you read through that, because what's going to happen to Abraham's family in the future? Yeah, the tables are going to get turned, <laughs> Right? And so it's interesting that this woman is an Egyptian maid, and um, not long, well, a long time, really, but, um, you know, 
from reading the text, it's not that long. It's only a few chapters, really. Then all of a sudden, Abraham's family is going to become enslaved by the Egyptians. And so these things are going to have a, take a turn here. Um, from what I've read, and I've read several different historical commentaries about th this time period, and there, there's a lot of um, agreement that this was a very common practice that uh, during their time, if the patriarch could not bear children um, with uh, his first wife, that they could bring in a maidservant. And basically what would happen was is the maidservant would, would have the child and the, the first wife could bring the child out of the tent as if it were her own. And that child would have full uh, rights as the firstborn of the family, um, that kind of an idea. It seems to be the way they did things. So it wasn't, probably wasn't uncommon. This wasn't something people would have been like, oh, wow, that's ridiculous. I can't believe you did that. We would think that today, right? Because that's kind of weird in our culture. Um, but in their culture, it seemed to be a very common practice um, if, if the wife could not bear children. Kind of like a surrogate. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something like a surrogate. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. And of course, a little bit later on, they stop calling her wife and start calling her servant again. But yeah, I, which is, you know, a source of discussion, of course. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And that was entirely possible. There was a sense in which they had multiple wives as well. Uh, so this situation was probably not super uncommon. Now, there's a lot of assumptions made here. We're not really given much detail, but we assume that Abraham is trying to, um, you know, help, help out a little bit here and try to make this promise become a reality. And, and if that assumption is true, um, it would show, maybe show a lack of, of faith, maybe some weakness in faith and God's ability to provide a child course, these are assumptions, and I'm just discussing the topic here. Um, despite the fact that Sarah, Sarah's age, his age, she was unable to bear a child, maybe, maybe they felt like if God's going to fulfill his promise, we're going to have to uh, actively help him in this process. And so that seems to be what's going on here. But despite that assumption, the main point, and um, is found in that one phrase that, that I, I mentioned before. Abram listened to his wife, uh, listened to the voice of, of Sarai. That, that one phrase is incredibly important because it is exactly worded the same as Genesis 3 and verse 17. And if you remember Genesis 3 and verse 17, um, it was Eve who was deceived and took the fruit and then gave it to her husband. And then later on, God is going to come along and have the conversation with them, and, and he's going to say those exact same words, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and then he's going to begin discussing the consequences of that. Um, but the phrase in Hebrew is identical, uh, except for, of course, you know, Sarai and your wife are obviously different, but the phrase is the same. So I believe it's designed to be kind of a hyperlink to jump us back there and say, oh, Man, it's happening again, all over again. We're seeing the same, same sin being repeated, and the same situation happening. Um, the effort that is put forth is, was probably, I'm going to venture to guess, that they had noble intentions in trying to help out and get this situation moving, make sure the promise is fulfilled. Um, I can see that they were probably wanting to, to see this thing through. Things didn't seem possible. It was seemingly impossible for the promise to become a reality. But what's going to happen here in this family that we're talking about is very similar to what happened in, in Adam's family. So when Adam and Eve had their episode and, and um, Adam listened to the voice of his wife, what happened to that family unit immediately? Did it, did it just move forward? Did they, you know, hold hands and support each other and encourage one another? Was that the, was that the response when God came with accusations? 
what, what, what happened to that family unit, Adam and Eve, that first family? Well, yeah, okay, all right. Um, but was it, was it good for their family? <laughs> was it good for Adam and Eve? Was it, was it something that was a healthy experience? Or, or did we see kind of backbiting and accusations and, and you, know, you know, the woman that you gave me, right? You're, she told me to eat. And there was a lot of circumstances that kind of come out of that. It's just damage, you know, problems, difficulties, uh, and so I think the same thing is happening with Abram's family. He's going to find that this instance, this moment, is not going to bring good results. Um, but we're going to see negative things come from this. Uh, there's going to be some difficulties between him and Sarai. And there's certainly going to be difficulties with, with Hagar uh, being in the mix. It's going to bring trouble to Abram's family. All right. Look at verse 3. It says, after Abram had lived, lived here 10 years in the land of, of Canaan, uh, Abraham's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and, and gave her to her husband Abram as his wife. That's what Greg was talking about earlier. And he went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was um, a despised in her sight. And Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but then she saw that she had conceived. I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your maid is in your power. And this is kind of what I was alluding to. A lot of commentators point out Abram's words here as he's, he doesn't call her wife at this point, but, you know, she's your maid now, <laughs> that kind of circumstance. In your power, do to her what is good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Uh, then again, this might just be a, a foreshadowing of some things that are about to happen. They're mistreating this Egyptian slave. They are treating her badly. They're treating her poorly. We don't know if she willingly participated in any of this. Um, she may not have wanted to. She may have been forced into the whole situation for all we know. But now we know there's mistreatment, and um, Sarai is going to treat Hagar badly. Um, and so then again, as I think through the story, I think, you know, it's ironic that they're going to treat this Egyptian poorly, and then their family is going to be treated poorly by Egyptians, um, as, as you continue to read. So obviously Sarah is, is at fault, just as Eve was at fault. Um, but she's also right in saying the things she says, that Abram brought struggle on the family, that Abraham brought the difficulty upon the family. And, and it's very similar to what we read about as you, as you read about Adam. Whenever we talk about the sin in the garden, when the New Testament discusses that, with the exception of Paul's writings to Timothy about um, Eve having been the one who was deceived. Who is the one who ultimately is, is, is tagged, if you will, with the one who sinned and, and caused the, the break? It's, yeah, Adam, Adam really gets that, he gets to carry that burden. He gets to carry that baggage. Um, why do you think that's the case? Why do you think it all really falls on, on Adam's shoulders? Yeah. I think that's correct. I think he was supposed to be the leader, and um, I think this was a, a falling short in his leadership role. He, it was his responsibility. So how does that apply to Abram in this circumstance? Um, yes, it was Sarah's idea. Yes, Sarah gave the maidservant, just like the giving of the fruit to, to, um, to Abram. But who ultimately gets the, the brunt of the blame here? Who do you think it is? It's, it's Abraham, right? It's Abram. Why is that? He's the head of the household, right? He should have put a stop to this whole thing. And, and then again, that comes back to what I was saying. Part of the struggle as being a, a leader is um, keeping the people who are in, in your care, 
encouraged and motivated. <laughs> uh, because he, he was probably very discouraged too. But he should have encouraged her. You know, God will keep his promise. God will keep his promise. But he goes along with this. And um, it just creates a tremendous amount of difficulty and struggle in, in his family. Um, and, and not just his family. But as you read about Hagar and you read about her son and you read about the, I mean, just Israel is going, it's going to be a thorn in Israel's side for generations to come, um, this difficulty. Um, But I think this story really highlights a faithful man and a faithful woman who, who are living in the shadow of God's promises, but are making some bad choices. And in this case, I think it highlights the leadership role. There's a difficult choice being made by Abram that creates problems for, for his family. And so biblical leadership comes with struggles and it comes with uh, difficulties. Okay, so I've got a couple of phrases I wanted to kind of give to you and let you think about as we conclude this lesson. Here's the first one. If per- perfection, if perfection was obtained... By willpower, if perfection was obtained by willpower, we would not need faith in God's power. Y'all, y'all hear that? So if perfection was within me, if I had the ability of my own willpower to be perfect, I would not need to put my faith in God's power. Um, but as it is, I cannot. It is not possible. So if perfection was obtained by willpower, we would not need faith in God's power. Um, Abraham wasn't perfect. Abraham wasn't perfect. But he had two things that made him a great leader. And what were they? Faith and hope. Faith and hope. And that's what made Abraham a great biblical leader uh, in this story. Any thoughts or questions? We've got a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was that guy you made before me, you know, him, Steve. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm, mm-hmm. Right. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, But yeah, that is extremely encouraging for us, Um, especially people who have not seen things like Abraham and, you know, Sarai and things like Moses and things like Noah. I mean, we have not actually literally put our eyes on some of these extraordinary things that they have seen. Um, Just like Peter talks about Jesus, you know, though you have not seen him, you believe him and you love him. And that whole idea that we, we did not see Jesus and we did not see him crucified and we did not see him resurrected. um, But uh, blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. And so we maintain our faith, even though, like Greg was saying, it, 
it does have some twists and turns in it, um, nonetheless. Very encouraging. All right, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and then we'll wrap this, this section up, this lesson for this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we are so encouraged by all the things you bless us with, and Father, there are times when we struggle to see, Father, the things that you have promised coming to a reality. Father, we, we struggle with our own faith, and, and we need encouragement, we need strength. Father, we, we need the examples of those who you have chosen to, to lead your people in the past, to help us to see that you are a keeper of all your promises, and that we can put our faith in you fully, that you are faithful. And we also need, Father, the strength and encouragement from those in the present, who have lived as people of faith and encourage and strengthen us and motivate us with hope. Thank you for all